Hi, I'm Rich Laveau. At Bloomfield College, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Bloomfield College, offering small classes and big opportunities since 1868. Investors Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities. Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey, healing begins here. MagnaCare, activists in cooperation with the American Medicine Chest Challenge, and by New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Now, I'm in Atlantic City, and uh, sometimes I like to gamble, but this is a sure thing. Now, take a look at that sign. Main Street, NJEA, that's the New Jersey Education Association. This is their convention. They've been coming down here since the early 1850s. That's right, educators of every stripe. Thousands of them, over 300 workshops. Um, incredible things go on here. They have a keynote speaker who comes from Finland talking about their educational system there and what we might be able to learn from them. Except, you know what he said? He said what they have over there that's doing well, they learn from us. Amazing stuff. We talk to educators across this country, across this state, about the things that we need to know. What's working, what's not working. We're here at the New Jersey Education Association Convention in Atlantic City. And uh, this is a half hour special that is uh, pretty special. You wonder where those uh, teachers are while your kids are home over those two days? They're right here in Atlantic City at the NJEA convention. Check it out. Since the 1850s, the New Jersey Education Association, they've been coming down to Atlantic City for this extraordinary convention. You've got thousands of educators and those connected to the field of teaching down here in Atlantic City. And uh, our good friend, Steve Wolmer, who heads up the communications operation for the NJEA is here. See, let me ask you, who is here in Convention Hall? Thousands of teachers, as you said, but also education support professionals, uh, just gathering information uh, about how to become better at their, at their profession. We have over 300 rec workshops for professional development credit in every possible area of, of educational expertise, uh, plenary sessions for, with international presenters and uh, experts in education. Uh, it's just a really fulfilling couple of days where people can really add to their resumes. Who is coming down here? What type of educator does come down for this two-day convention? From what we can tell, educators of all stripes, every age, every discipline, uh, whether you're a math teacher in the high school level or a kindergarten teacher or a special ed teacher, or whether you're a custodian or, or a, a, a cafeteria worker. What are they looking for? They're looking for uh, new skills, uh, the latest in their profession, uh, we have High Tech Hall here. It's now a third of the floor space. High Tech Hall. High Tech Hall, where teachers are teaching other teachers in the latest educational technology. It gets bigger every year. This is stuff they're using every day in their classroom, but they're getting better at it here. And, and the manufacturers and, and, and people who make this technology love this event. They come in big numbers and set up for us and let, let teachers do the teaching. It's really, yeah. really nice. We're going to show you some video of uh, the, it's great, uh, our production operation, the Caucus Educational Corporation is cloud, proud to have four Emmy Awards, but we're going to show you <laughs> this video of uh, the, I call it the trophy case, the Emmy case for classroom close-up. How many do you guys have? They don't even have all of them in there because they didn't have enough room. How many? Two of them are apparently on loan. We have 12. In, in, in 20 years, we've, we've gotten tw uh, 12 Emmys. Very what is the series? Oh, it's a wonderful series. Classroom Close-Up New Jersey is a, a half-hour show with four seven-minute segments. Every one of them a great story from a different classroom in New Jersey. Great news about public education. Our schools really do wonderful work. And celebrate educators educators and the work they do. We have, a, we have a library, a video library on our website of now over about 1,300 segments that have been shot in those 20 years. Uh, Classroom Close-Up has been everywhere and the executive producer has a stack a mile high on her desk of future projects, so it's a great show. We are here with uh, Posse Salberg, who is um, a keynote speaker here at the NJA convention. He's the author of Finished Lessons, What Can the World 
Learn from Educational Change in Finland. It is an honor to have you. At this convention, you see thousands of educators and others connected to the world of education. What do you sense about educators in this state from your time, not just as a keynote speaker, but just you know, walking the floor of this convention hall? Well, you know, I see, I, I meet many people asking questions, and, and they probably ask questions when, I, when they know that I come from a very different, different culture. And, um, you know, many people are asking, is there any hope here? Is there? Is, is there any hope? Yeah, they, I, I, you know. We want to know, is there? No, I think you have more hope than any other country other than Finland has in, in, in education, because, you, you know, many of these ideas that we have used, or Canadians have used, or Singaporeans or Chinese have used when they have be, been building these school systems and education systems that are now out, outperforming the United States are American ideas. Amer well, hold on. You're Posse saying that a lot of the things that are working in Finland were our ideas to begin with? No, you know, I'm not only saying that, but I'm saying that if you, want, if you don't believe that the American educational innovations are good enough for America, just come and see Finland, and I can show you how American ideas and education, uh, innovation in education work in a large scale. So, you know, that's where the hope comes from, that you have all these elements, you have all these ideas, you even have all these people and research in this country that can make your education system perform much, much better than it does. So that's what, you know, if you haven't, if you were depending on I, educational ideas and innovations and methods and models, just like we had been, or Singaporeans had been uh, during the course of the last uh, 20, 30 years, then you would be in trouble. But you have everything here. And you have the money, you have the resources here that you spend in education. Uh, you already spend more e in education than we do, or many other countries do. So, you know, if you, have, if you were poor, that you had the problem was that you don't have money to do these things, then you, I think then we would be speaking about lack of hope and a problem. You have, you guys, you have everything here. Just you got great people too. Yeah, you have great people and you have this, you know, the thing that we do not have. America has this can-do mentality, that if you really want to do, if you want to send a man to the moon, you can do that. If you want to change the school system and thinking how people think about education and public education, you can do that. So now the question is, are your politicians and uh, authorities and those people who have the power able to do, change the way they think? That I don't know. We're here with Grant Wiggins, president of Authentic Education, which is? In Hopewell, New Jersey, where we help teachers, administrators, State Department of Ed people, national people in other countries to improve assessment and curriculum around the world. Let's talk about assessment. What is the challenge with student assessment? What are we getting right? What are we getting wrong? Good question. Uh, what we need to do differently is we want to assess what we value and not just what's easy to test and easy to score. So we want students who can argue, justify their arguments, engage critically and creatively with tasks, but we have a long tradition of just assessing what's easy to quickly test and quickly score. Uh, worse, we have kids who think they're doing real well because of what's happening locally in their grades and on their tests, but we've got a 40% remediation rate in New Jersey colleges and community colleges because the information that they've gotten locally is that they're better prepared than they really are. It, if you look at the grades given in any school system, any school system, from the best in New Jersey to the worst, you're gonna see the same distribution of grades, of A's and B's and C's and D's. But wait a minute, the best school and the worst school have the same distribution of grades. Something's not right. And, and of course, we've known this for a long time. You not only have the remediation issue, they know this in um, offices of admission at every college. One of the reasons why we have SATs and ACTs is because you can't actually know from the transcript what the kid is actually able to do. And this is the whole point of the new Common Core Standards. They're meant to see if you're genuinely workplace and college ready in a way that we haven't really communicated effectively to kids locally. What impact does all this have on educators? It's a difficult time. It's a difficult time because people, I think, recognize at some level that we have to raise the bar. At another level, we have a problem because now they're being held accountable for these scores. So it's kind of a raw deal. It's like we know we have to do better and we suddenly raise the bar and now your accountability scores as a teacher and in a school are based on the raised bar. So that kind of affects the whole atmosphere. Rather than saying, 
look, it's just like sports. We want you to get better. We're not going to grade everything you do. Here's your time in the 400. Make it's it about improvement. It's about improvement. And the whole point of the standards movement and good pedagogy is about improvement and an attitude and an atmosphere of improvement. But we haven't had an assessment and a grading system that's kept pace with that idea. We were talking to uh, Mark Morton, who is the Teacher of the Year, 2014-2015 Teacher of the Year, Wallace Elementary School in Hoboken. First of all, congratulations. Thank you very much. What does it feel like to be the Teacher of the Year? Well, it's uh, overwhelming, but at the same time, I'm very honored and humbled to be able to represent all the teachers of New Jersey. Talk about where you teach and who you teach. I teach at Wallace Elementary. I teach um, for the Hoboken Public School District. Uh, I educate preschool children with autism. You know, as I was reading, I was reading about this guy, it is actually amazing the impact that you've had. Talk about the use of technology in your classroom, um, how you use it, and the impact it's had on your students. Sure. I'm, I would say back in 2010, I really started using the technology to the fullest potential. Um, I really started when I realized we need to go a little more outside the box when educating our children and um, there wasn't a lot available. So I started designing, I developed an app and then I started using those tools that I needed that weren't available. Um, and I saw increasing productivity in my classroom, but also I saw the children kind of being a little motivated and they were more interested in learning where in the past they weren't. So as technology evolved, more apps became available. I started incorporating that into my classroom but it wasn't only the apps, it was the iPads and delivery system. I need to make sure the content within those apps were appropriate for the students. And if they weren't, I found other ways of putting content on the app using productivity apps. So making sure that each one of those child were able to learn using individualized instruction with their materials that they were able to learn from. And then from there, we start branching out to more generalized instruction. What kind of impact did you see it have on your students? I think for the children that I work with, there is um, there are very limited um, things that they're interested in. Uh, TV, media is one thing that they are interested in. So I use that to my advantage because I knew that I can hold their interest, but at the same time, balance the reward part of it, but the educational part of it. And I saw them provide a better interest. I saw them, you know, start. Um, learning things that they never learned by using traditional materials on the iPad. And once they really started learning that concept on the iPad, I slowly integrated the traditional materials to see if I was able to bring it back to the table. So not only did they learn one way, but I taught them the other way as well. It's interesting. It's one thing to actually become the teacher of the year, but I'm curious, I'm sure a lot of people watching on public broadcasting and on Fios right now are curious as to who and what motivated you to actually become an educator in the first place. Interesting. It happened about 19 years ago. Uh, at first, you know, I didn't really want to be an educator. Did not. I wasn't. No, I, you know, I was in high school. I was the average student, but I had a friend who was a teacher, and she asked me, you know, you're the type of person. I volunteered at a camp. Would you like to work in education? I said, sure. Long story short, the only position that was open was an aide for a child with Angelman syndrome. It's a genetic disorder, and I said, sure, I'll try it. So I tried it. I was skeptical at first because I didn't know if I had the skills to help them. You know, there's times that I said, you know, maybe I should just maybe not work with them. But I didn't. Why did you say that? Because I didn't want to. But because I didn't was I didn't have the skills confident because I only worked as an aide. I wasn't a teacher yet. I was more of an instructor. But there wasn't that many people at the time that knew how to work with him. So I said, you know what? I'm not going to be one of many people that would not work with this child because if I quit, there's going to be other people to quit, and I refuse to quit on that child. And he's the reason that I'm an educator. He changed my life. He, I saw things, you know, maybe slowing, you know, he was learning a little slower, but that was okay because I had a direction. He knew I had a direction. You really remember this kid in detail? I do. I'll never forget. I'm not going to ask you his name, but... He's 26 years old now. I started when he was five. Well, hold on. Say that again. He's 26 now. And his mother sends me a Christmas card every year. We've always stayed in touch. What's that like for you? Words can't describe it, to be honest with you. It's, um, you know, you don't realize the impact you make on children's lives, but yet the biggest is that the impact they make on yours. And for him, his impact allowed me the opportunity to help special needs children throughout my whole career. Were you hooked? I was hooked. I, I wouldn't leave it for the world.
I want to introduce uh, Becky Pringle, who is Vice President at NEA, which stands for the? National Education Association, the largest labor union in this country. We are talking about the fact that um, the way teachers are evaluated um, causes you and your colleagues some concern, does it not? A concern is probably an understatement. <laughs> What's and, the know, problem with how we do it? It's not just about the evaluation. Of course it is about that. It is about the overuse and misuse of testing that has led to this bad accountability system that's really rampant throughout this country. And it's steeped in this blame and shame premise, this blame frame that is not about improving education for our students. It's not about making sure that our teachers have the conditions they need for good teaching and learning. It's not about what this country needs for all of our students to be successful. It's about blaming and shaming. What would be the rationale? What would be the logic behind that? And who would benefit? The why is because so much of this was created without educators. It's shocking. It's shocking. We're one of the few professions where we don't have control and power over our own profession. And so all of these systems were put into place without the voice of educators at the table creating and crafting them. Because we understand that if you're not focused on students, if it's not a student-centered accountability system, then it's going to be flawed. It's going to fail. And it's going to lead to what we've, we're now calling toxic testing. Toxic testing testing, break that down. So for us, toxic, toxic testing is the kind of testing that leads to, to the corruption of, of teaching and learning. You know, I'm a teacher, been for over 30 years. I love tests. Mm. But I understand the purpose of tests. That is to identify what our kids need to, need to know. We need to identify how we have to improve our professional practice. We need to identify what resources they need so that every one of them can be successful. It's not about, you know, finding the bad teachers. It's not about that. We know that if we support our teachers, that we provide them with professional development and, and opportunities for ongoing learning, then they will continue to improve their practice over the course of their, of their career. But to actually build a system on finding the bad teachers. You think this is about gotcha? Absolutely. It is absolutely about gotcha. And we know that if, you, if, you're, if you're building a system like that, it's not about the kids. And by the way, Steve, who, who is hurt the most? It's our kids. If a teacher is identified, uh, or through this process, through teacher evaluation, is identified as not doing his or her job, regardless of whether someone agrees with the system or not. How is a student hurt? A couple of ways a student is hurt. First of all, let me go back to the system. Because if you're building a system around that, then you know that you are automatically building a system where you're going to narrow the curriculum down to the subjects that are being tested. That's it. You're also building a system where... You mean teaching to the test? Teaching to the test. You're also building a system where oftentimes, you've heard this uh, stories all over the country, where you're leading to, to, toward corruption or where you're focusing your efforts on those kids that are on the bubble so they can make it, so they can hit that cut score on a standardized test. You're not, you're not focusing on those students that are high achievers. You're not, you're not even focusing on those students who are the lowest achievers. You're just focusing on the students to get over that bubble. That's a corruption of the system. That is hurting our kids. What would you say to those who are watching this right now and say, hold on, that the, that the National Education Association representative, one of the highest ranking officials in the NEA is saying, you know, she wants to lower the standards for our kids. That that's, that's what they may be hearing right now. What would you say to them right now? Absolutely not. The NEA and the mem three million members of the NEA have, have been supportive of high standards, making sure that every student, a student is held to them. But we also know that you have to provide the students with the support so that every single student can, student can reach those high standards. We are talking about raising those standards so that we are focused on testing what matters. We're focused on critical thinking skills and problem solving skills and working together. Those kinds of skills that both, we're, both our employers as well as higher education, as well as when we think about the future of this country, we know our students need. We are absolutely in favor of that and fighting for that. But I will tell you, when we talk about toxic testing, that flies in the face of all of that. We're here with the executive director of the NJEA, Ed Richardson. Ed, how you doing? Doing great, Steve. Thank you for uh, having a conversation here. Well, I'll tell you what, there are all sorts of people walking all over the place, thousands of educators and others connected to the world of education. What makes this convention, before we get into some very substantive and some controversial topics, what makes this convention so exciting for you, Ed? 
Well, it is the centerpiece of professional development offerings for our members. And this is a place where they can come and bond with their colleagues, learn together, and really experience some cutting edge things that frankly, uh, the majority of our school districts couldn't even begin to deliver. Uh, if you've been to High Tech Hall, there are smart board presentations going on there. People learning how to use technology in their classroom with their students and in very new and innovative ways. So even that, I mean, no school district could bring that to their district. It's really important for the teachers and other staff in the state to be able to come here and learn things like that. And then just to really have an opportunity to bond with their colleagues and share their experiences and, and, and uh, you know, have uh, a couple of days to really focus on them and their role as uh, educators. One of the uh, themes here in Atlantic City at the NJEA convention is testing, student evaluation, which is really about teacher evaluation as well. I mean, you can't separate them. Ed's got some strong feelings about it. We'll talk about it. What is your greatest concern right now, Ed, about testing and the way it's being done right now in the state of New Jersey? I think overall there's just an overemphasis on standardized assessment and uh, it's being used in a variety of ways that are at least questionable and if not completely inappropriate. You raised teacher evaluation and uh, you know we were successful in reaching some negotiations, some, some uh, agreement with the administration on trying to de-emphasize that. And then just yesterday, uh, the Department of Education announced that uh, they're concerned as we transition to the new park that uh, basically the uh, the bench. No, you use jargon, educational jargon, right away. The new par, which is the. It's park. It's um, park. Excuse me. Yes, the uh, partnership for the assessment of uh, college and career readiness. But the Department of Education did what? They announced yesterday that they're concerned that as we move to this new standardized uh, assessment program next year, uh, later this, this school year, that the results are going to uh, be a, a little bit of a, a performance cliff. And so they're saying that we have to use year one to benchmark what we're going to do going forward. And yet, What's wrong with that? Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but this test is going to be used this year as part of our teacher evaluations. So if we're concerned about uh, the benchmarking of the results, why are we using this brand new assessment to it as part of our teacher evaluations? Why not delay that? Uh, so, you know, that's just one whole area of, of concern about the testing. The other thing that is, is a, a universal concern, you talk to educators, parents, uh, it's the, the amount of instructional time and instructional resources that are being diverted to standardized testing in our schools. And it's not just the park that is uh, being required by the state, it's a variety of other uh, standardized assessments that districts themselves are using. But we have members and parents telling us that as, as many as 60 to 70 days of the school year uh, are involved in administering standardized tests. That's out of 180, 185 days of school. What are the implications of that? It, uh, it, it, it tends to shift emphasis away from instruction and onto the measurement of instruction. And, and you are sort of then, um, uh, you know, kind of subverting the, the, the important, uh, what's important about uh, our schools, which is the delivery of the content, not, uh, not the assessment of the content. Assessment's important, but uh, it shouldn't be overemphasized. We're here with Dr. Stephanie Hyde, who is a former teacher and administrator, just finished up a workshop here at the New Jersey Education Association Convention in Atlantic City. What did you tell the educators who were there, and um, what was their reaction? Well, my workshops are principally around teachers finding their voice in this evaluation process. Um, it's a struggle because there's a lot of variability across the state, a lot of conflicting information, misinformation, lack of training. And uh, so one of my goals in my work with NJA is to make sure that the teachers are empowered with the information they need to be a vocal part of the process because in the end that's what's going to benefit the students. Are they not right now? Are the teachers not a vocal part of the process as you say? Well, many of them are making great efforts towards that, but they're hamstrung by not having some of the knowledge that they really need. Like what? Um, well, we have multiple models in place across the, the state in terms of um, evaluation. So we've got the Danielson model in over half the districts, but we've got Strong, McCrell, Marzano. Um, so there's a wide variation. Many of the teachers weren't prepared to use the model that their districts are implementing um, and they haven't received the kind of professional development and education that they really need. Um, I admire the teachers here at NJA because they're taking steps on their own outside of their district work to make sure they have the knowledge for them to be advocates for themselves and in the end they're advocates for their kids. Break that, break that down. So if, a, if an educator here at the convention takes the initiative to learn more, 
about these different evaluation models. How does that benefit their students? Well, most of the models do have criteria that asks the teachers to put their best foot forward, to provide the best instruction for their students. So if they want to be successful in their own evaluations, it's really the byproduct is that the instruction is going to improve for the students. Um, unfortunately, what we've got is a, a bit of a, a, an un mistimed effort, right? You know, we've got, we're kind of, um, this analogy has been very hackneyed at this point, but building the plane while we're flying the plane. So we're implementing it and evaluating the teachers while they're still actually learning how to use these evaluative models. But once they do get armed with the information they need, it impacts their instruction in pretty positive ways because they, they are talking about how they're improving their instruction for their students, and then they're also doing well. There's a side benefit in that they do well in their evaluative model. So it really does serve both purposes. After talking to international experts, national experts, members, uh, leaders of the New Jersey Education Association, uh, the Teacher of the Year, all sorts of wonderful people, come back with our uh, friend Steve Womer, who heads up the communication operation the NJA. I got to ask you, what keeps educators coming back year after year to this event? I think they know, Steve, that this is the place they can come every year to get the very latest in professional development, no matter what they do, whether you're a math teacher or a special needs teacher, you can get the latest here. It's a terrific resource for them every year. The other thing is when you walk into a convention hall, you are blown away by not only how many people are here, but the booths, the exhibits, the energy, um, the value of what goes on here. It's, it's really amazing. And I ask myself, what the heck does it take to put this on? It, and how long does it take to get this whole thing together? Well, we have a team of people that are going to meet next week to start planning next year's convention. That's really? how long it takes. It's a year-long endeavor. But it takes a lot of work, a lot of energy, and a lot of resources. And NJEA members pay for this event out of their own dues dollars. That's, that's what funds this event. So that's the, they're really investing in their own professional futures by supporting this convention. And uh, they, they love it. And they've, they turn out every year. So, Steve, thank you for allowing us to be here with our cameras. And we look us. forward to being back next year. Pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Catch you next year at the NGA convention right here in AC. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Bloomfield College, Investors Bank, New Jersey Natural Gas, Holy Name Medical Center, MagnaCare, Activus, in cooperation with the American Medicine Chess Challenge, and New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com, and by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Did you know that the enrollment period under the Affordable Care Act ends February 15th? For those who are still uninsured, you may be eligible for financial support. But those who do not sign up for insurance must pay a fine of $325 or more. Every plan covers preventative care, doctor visits, and prescriptions. And with over 40 plans to choose from, you have every opportunity to get on the road to health.